This is an interview with Pete Driscoll for the SEC Historical Society's Virtual Museum and Archive on the History of Financial Regulation. Today is March 15th, 2023, and I'm Kenneth Durr. Pete, good to talk to you. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. It's, yeah. a, it's a great place here. Well, let's, yeah. let's start with the beginning and, and go back into your education uh, and sort of untangle how you ended up uh, in this career. Sure. Um, so I, I, I when I, at college, I, I, I was looking for a major, and um, a number of my family members were in the accounting space. And so I thought that at the time there was, um, you know, pretty strong job placement in the accounting area, particularly with the large accounting firms. And uh, I think at that time it was big six. And, uh, and so, um, so I, 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 that's what I focused on and majored in in, in, in undergrad and, and then went to work for a big six firm at, you know, right after I graduated with, with a few friends. School? So I went to St. Louis University, okay. which is, that's where I grew up, was in St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. Yeah. Talk about that experience at, at one of the big six uh, accounting firms. What was that like? It was a great experience. The thing I liked most about it um, was just the variety of different types of clients you had and that you saw. And so I had clients that were mining clients. I had clients that manufactured whiskey barrels. I had you know, it, large automotive manufacturers. So just a wide variety of different types of clients. And for me, that was very interesting to learn about about business, but also to learn different approaches from an accounting perspective, an audit perspective. So. Did you have any interface with regulation, securities regulation in particular? You know, I didn't. I always had an interest in it, and which was something that, you know, particularly at that time, I started to follow the stock market a little bit more. This would have been early 90s. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for me, it, it, you know, it was always an interest. Um, However, at that time, I didn't have any publicly traded clients. So I was in a, in, in a group that was called Entrepreneurial Services, which dealt primarily with private. So, okay, so yeah. very different requirements then if they're private firms. Exactly, yeah. Okay. yeah. So how did, you, how did you come to the SEC? Sure, so it, it, it's interesting. So, so what I ended up doing is, is I ended up leaving public accounting and I was a financial controller for, for a company. And I remember having a conversation with um, someone who worked for the U.S. Attorney's Office in St. Louis. And, and he was a, 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 a sibling of, of a friend of mine um, that I had known for, for a long time. And the work he did for um, the U.S. Attorney's Office just seemed incredibly rewarding. Um, and so it was that day that I hung up the phone and said, you know, I'm going to go to law school. And so I ended up taking, embarking on a four-year journey where I, I went to law school at night, also at St. Louis University, and worked during the day as a financial reporting manager in the accounting position, and just loved you know, the law school experience. Um, but as I got closer to graduation, you know, I had an, a career in the accounting space, but I, I went to law school for a reason. And so, so I looked around at where I felt I would best land. And, you know, I thought back to that conversation with somebody from the Department of Justice, and I thought, boy, working for the federal government would be a really rewarding experience, serving the public, serving others. And I ended up thinking, well, but with my accounting experience, I could leverage that at you know, a, a, a government agency like the SEC. And this was, mind you, this was back in 2000. So it was before WorldCom, Enron. It was before Sarbanes-Oxley. You know, I, I would like to say that the, the agency was a little bit sleepier then. Um, and then I started at the SEC um, in September of 2001. Um, so just, just right after 9-11, um, later that month, and uh, moved to Chicago, and um, and that started a 20-year career. So, so you, you went into enforcement, right? In I Chicago? did. Yeah. So, so it was interesting when I was coming out. I had interviewed with well, I, actually, I, to step back, I, I, I failed to mention. I, I did an internship. I was a summer intern in the Division of Enforcement in Chicago, and. That was a great experience. I worked with some very seasoned 
um, enforcement attorneys like John Sakura and Jamie Davidson and Jane Jarko and and and, and Dan Gregus and some some folks that you know I really had a great experience and I loved it and so when I was looking to decide what to do permanently I interviewed in in DC at the Division of Corporation Finance and then I also interviewed um, in enforcement and and ultimately I chose to do enforcement one I was closer to home but two I had worked you know the previous summer there and I just I knew people and, and, and I just really enjoyed that aspect of it and so so yeah so I joined enforcement at, at, at the Chicago region well I was actually the Midwest regional office at that time before they you know changed the nomenclature a little bit so. I understand people still call it the Chicago regional <laughs> office anyway though. yeah <laughs> Who was, uh, who was the regional administrator at that point? So, so at that point, Mary Keefe. And, and so Mary Keefe actually hired me. Um, and, you know, it was great because, you know, I got to work for when I was an intern. But, you know, the limited exposure to the regional director at the time. Um, but then she was, in, you know, involved in the hiring process. And I met with her. And, and, uh, and fortunately, I, I got on. And... Uh, very, very fortunate. I, I, I love the role. So, so were you staff attorney at that point? I was staff point? attorney, yeah. What kind of work did you do? So it, I did investigative work, but then I also, early on, three months into the role, I um, ended up being put on a, a, a Ponzi scheme out, based out in L.A. And it was about a, I don't know, three to four hundred million dollar Ponzi scheme. and. It was based in federal court, so we had to go into federal court. We did a, a TRO, we did an asset freeze, we had an, a receiver appointed, and you know it ended up being some work that I did for a number of years after that, particularly working with the receiver to recover money for investors, um, and then also you, you know in terms of just going through that process to litigate it because it wasn't a settled matter it was litigated and so uh, great experience for me and then because I had some Fed court experience they ended up um, assigning me to some other cases like insider trading case that had been brought and a few other matters and and you know really enjoyed that but did a lot of litigation at that time did you um, work with the DOJ I did uh, in a couple instances. A couple of my cases had, you know, uh, criminal elements, and, and some of the defendants in those cases ended up um, being indicted and convicted. So you were a litigator, I guess, in this, this first part of your career. Surprisingly, so yes, I didn't. I, you know, when, when I had my interview with with Mary Keefe, she said, "Don't expect to be in federal court." in your first few years, and, and I kind of got lucky, and so I got that experience very early on. What's, what's the difference between what the litig a litigator would do in that situation and an investigative attorney? So, so oftentimes an, a, a, an investigative attorney will investigate an alleged wrongdoing, do testimonies, talk with company witnesses or outside witnesses, talk to victims. Um, and really try to work to, to build a theory of the case to see, one, has there been a violation, and two, assess whether or not we should bring a matter in that, in that case. And then once the matter is actually brought, at least at this time, then typically the case was turned over, if it was going to be litigated in federal court, turned over to trial counsel, which is a position in, 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 in enforcement that they're typically seasoned trial attorneys. And so like John Birkenheyer in the Chicago office, you know, led that program. And then Amy Cotter, who was really instrumental in, in, in my experiences, and, and, and Kay Pishka, they both really helped me. They were both trial counsel at the time and really helped me, you know, because I was a newbie. And, and, and so really helped me, along with like Jean Jarko, who was my supervisor, um, and Jamie Davidson, and, and worked very closely with them throughout the, you know, the, that case and, and a few others. And, and, and so, like, you'll, you'll hear, like, like, Jane was really a mentor to me in multiple points in my career and throughout, all the way through to, you know, um, both of our final days at the SEC, you know, in, in senior roles for exams. So. 
it sounds like great experience. This this um, litigate or yeah, litigation type experience. Um, but at some point, you decided to go to the exam side. Was I, that the accountant? Didn't you I say did. I really want to you know use that skill? Or you know, it, it's interesting. So what happened there is, is is before I joined the SEC and went to law school, I was a manager. I managed people, and a couple things initiated my move to the exam side. One was I ended up um, having, uh, having you know, th there were some postings for branch chief positions in the exam program. And so I applied to one of those because it was a manager role. It was progression from a career perspective. The real driver, though, is I was really excited, not that there was anything wrong with the litigation piece, but it was oftentimes suing for prior conduct or investigating conduct that may be a couple years old. And what was attractive to me about the compliance examination program was you would get ahead of those issues oftentimes and try to fix the issues before they became a real problem, before there was investor loss, before you know, the need for an enforcement action would come in. And so that really drove kind of my perspective in terms of I love the enforcement you know, experience, but at the same time I thought, you know, I could help people quick, more quickly um, by being in the exam program. And, and I think, you know, as we talk today, I think what you'll see is, is that that's driven a lot of my approach um, as I've had various roles within the exam program. So. Getting out in front of things, I guess. Yes, exactly. So, but you ended up in um, the investment company, investment advisor area. I did. Was that just the, the job that was open? Did you have a choice? It, it's, it's funny you say that. I, 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 both the broker-dealer program and the advisor program had openings. And at the time, I thought, well, I probably would fit better just with my accounting background in the broker-dealer program. But I was open to both. They were both branch chief roles. And I ended up getting selected for the advisor, investment advisor, investment company space. And very happy I did. I mean, talk about, uh, you know, the growth trajectory for investment advisor registrations and assets under management and the mutual fund growth over the last 20 years. I was really fortunate that I landed there just given everything I saw. And, and it actually, at the end of the day, aligned a lot with kind of my own interests that I mentioned earlier that you know, when, once I started public accounting, I just had an interest in the markets and, and a lot of it was driven based on investing. And so that's where it was a good match for me. And, and, and I was lucky because I, I ended up working for Tom Kirk there, who was my assistant director and had the pleasure of working for him for close to six years. And just a wonderful man, spent his career in that program, subject matter expert in the mutual fund space, and just a great mentor to me. And it just really was, I, I, I just, that was a very pleasant time in my career in terms of just having a great boss and someone that I, I learned a ton from. And, Tom was a natural teacher, and so very, very good experience for me at that time. Did you know what you were getting into? The, the, the fact that the investment advisor industry was just growing by leaps and bounds? I did not. I did not. I, I knew a little bit about it, and, and it interested me just with these large, you know, they were moving to these large mutual fund complexes that were very retail based. So I spent a, you know, some time there focused on that, but, but not, not ever anticipating how fast it would grow, and how broadly it would grow. So, so no. You mentioned the, the mutual fund complexes. That was one, one part of the growth, I guess. What were some other things that were behind that growth from your perspective? So, so I think retail investors investing more in mutual funds more broadly, and then towards the latter part of my time there, and then the, the introduction of ETFs you know, exchange tri traded products, um, which some of those were registered investment companies. And so we'd, we, we'd be responsible for examining and, and, the, and they would fall in the SEC's jurisdiction. Um, but I think generally though, I think the ability and the connectivity of retail investors to that space 
And, and honestly, you know, you think about that time, the internet really was kind of blowing up in the early, you know, late 1990s and then 2000s. And so I think the ability to interface more directly on a retail basis with some of these large mutual fund complexes where you'd send in a check or potentially wire money, you know, so there, so there was just more availability, I think, in awareness, just, and, and, and a lot of that came from, I think, that, you know, just the proliferation of the internet, and just how, right. you know, and, 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 and I sound really old when I talk about that, because, <laughs> because it, it, but I do think that that was a significant factor in some of the growth of these, just because they were, it allowed for a lot more investors to be reached by mutual fund complexes, mm -hmm. so. Talk about the day-to-day. -day. I, I assume you had a number of, of clients or, or companies that you were, you were looking at. Um, just give me a, a general what, what your day was like, what your sure. week or month was yeah, like. Yeah, no, it's a great question. The, uh, so, so, so we were responsible in the Chicago region of, I think it was 11 states. And so we would go out on exams, typically one week a month. I'd be teamed, I'd be the, the branch chief on, you know, on a particular exam, and it would be staffed with a lead examiner, and oftentimes other examiners, and we'd travel to a city, and if it was a large investment advisor, uh, our mutual fund complex, you know, we may sp spend the whole week at that firm, or multiple weeks, particularly with large mutual fund complexes. Those would be larger teams at the time, and just, a, a lot more to look at. And oftentimes, if we went to a firm, we would cover all the registered entities. So we'd cover the advisor, we'd cover a transfer agent for a mutual fund, and we'd cover um, all the mutual funds that were registered. And so, so that was something that we spent a lot of time doing. And we, what was neat about that is like the day-to-day -day at that time, uh, you know, Branch chiefs would also take areas to, to, to look at. And so we'd work with the team, we'd divide up the scope areas that we were responsible for to look at, and then each take an area. And then the assistant director that was assigned to that exam, once we were finished, we'd draft up, at that time it was called a report. Um, and this was before technology improvements and you know, workflow processes, you know, and, 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 and certain systems that we developed after, you know, but early on it was, we'd draft up a long report and then at the end of the report, there'd be a letter. And so we'd send that deficiency letter to the registrant for, you know, asking them to fix things basically, or observations of things we've identified. Were these cause exams or cyclical exams? You know, a combination of both. Um, at that time, there was more cyclical exams because, frankly, th there were fewer registrants. Um, and so we had staffing that we could set some cadence to how often we'd actually go out and do an exam. Um, but oftentimes, th we would get tips that came in or investors that would call up saying, hey, I can't, I can't, I can't get my money, I can't, get, you know, I can't reach my investment advisor, they're not answering the phone. I go to their office space and it's vacant. You know, it's things like that that all of a sudden, okay, we're, we're bird dogging this to run it down to find, you know, what's going on. Did they just move or is it something, you know, more nefarious than that? So, For an examiner, did those two types of, of examinations feel different because of the situation? Oh, absolutely. There, there was, um, you know, there was, there was a, a lot more planning that took place when we would do a more routine or a cyclical type of exam because there was a lot of things that we wanted to cover. We wanted to be thoughtful about it. You know, if this was our one shot within a couple year period, three to five years, we wanted to make sure we did a thorough job and, 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 and cover the important areas. With cause exams, it was, we're going out tomorrow. It was, let's see what we can get you know, in the meantime, and then show up at a firm and say, okay, here's the books and records we need to see immediately. So it was a very different style. You know, oftentimes they weren't announced, um, whereas in, in a routine exam or cyclical exam, you'd announce it ahead of time that you're coming, okay, this week we're gonna be out, you know, please make sure that you have people available, things like that. And so, 
Um, so yeah, so there, there, there definitely was a, a different temperament when, and urgency when those cause exams came in. So. And I would, I would suppose that the firms themselves had a different attitude toward the examiners. I mean, yes, times. they did. Yes, that, that sometimes those could be very hostile um, and, and difficult registrants, particularly if they knew that there were some challenges going on. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they didn't necessarily understood, they didn't understand the, the, the impact of, of us being there and the significance of that, that if we found certain things that we believed could be happening, that we would refer it to enforcement. And then a whole different temperature existed in terms of having that backdrop where the firm was going to potentially get sued. And then in some cases, it could be criminal. And so there could be, you know, U.S. attorney interest, depending on what city we were in. So, okay. um, Just a couple more points on, on your Chicago time. Please. Um, technology, how were you doing your work? Was it spreadsheets? Was it manuals and, and checklists? So, um, I think early on, it was the documentation was was no no pages, and some word documents that would get print out, and it was paper files typically. Um, there were also some we would save like uh, discs, were come this was before CDs, you know, discs, you know, little three by three or whatever it was. Um, those would get put in the file, and those would be, you know, document productions we received from. The, the, the firms we were examining. Um, that progressed to where things were um, typed. You know, a lot of Excel spreadsheets too. I mean, there was a lot of analysis that was done. Um, so much of the work we did on investment advisors was, was looking at financial statements, looking at accounting records, looking at um, certain filings. Um, so there was a lot of analysis and analytics that was done just more manually, um, trade blotter analysis. So we look at trading that the firm would do. And I think that this is an interesting place where um, you know, certain tools that were developed later really, really improved that process. But the trade blotter you know, was a list of every trade that the firm did and it was in Excel. And so we'd say we were gonna look at cross trades. You know, We'd have to sort the Excel spreadsheet by same security, same day, um, buy, sell to see if there was a cross. Um, and oftentimes the Excel spreadsheets for the larger firms, we, we couldn't fit everything into one file. So that was a challenge. So you had space limitations in, in a standard Excel document. Um, you know, I, I think what ended up happening is we leveraged technology toward the end of my time at, at, at uh, the Chicago office where we were getting better tools to help us more analytically analyze the, the trading in a way that was more automated, allowed us to, 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 to exceed some of the space limitations we previously had with Excel. We used access and then it ended up, we, we ended up hiring quants to really blow out that, that program. And now it's the National Exam Analytics Tool, NEAT, and that was built by a lot of quants with the help of uh, a number of examiners, particularly in the Chicago office. We had, we had some really, Andy Shelton, Ahmad Elsabay, they really helped us build out that program because they had the technical, uh, they had the, the, the federal securities law and examination experience, and the quants had the technology experience. And matching those two really helped us build out a tool that is so user friendly that, so. Did you do that in Chicago? Build that tool. It's no, a precursor to it. Um, that team was very instrumental in building out the national tool, because we were leveraging technology that was based, you know, it was, it was owned and controlled by the Office of Information Technology in D.C., and so there was a you know a lot of stakeholders in in the development of those types of tools. It included the subject matter experts in Chicago and other regions got involved, New York got involved and other regions, LA. Um, and then we had the quant team, which in many ways they're very much technologists. 
Um, and then we had the Office of Information Technology that really drove, um, you know, as an agency. They had budget, they had resources from the system, they knew the systems and how the tool that we built would be better for this, you know, it would fit into the SEC network. So. But you had a prototype in Chicago. Was that just moving to access from, from Excel? Yeah, I think generally. And, and that was a big move for us, um, you know, versus Excel. And because it, it built in in access, you could build in some templates uh, and run some queries that um, you couldn't necessarily do. It was much more manual in Excel. So, yeah. Okay. Well, one other thing. You were ethics liaison for a little while. I was. Right? Yeah. yeah. What did that involve? Sure. So um, what that involved is we, we would have new employees come in, um, and every at that time, every regional office had an ethics liaison, which would cover anything that was in, included in the Office of Government Ethics Guidelines. So it included personal trading and holdings of securities. It included conflicts of interest. So if we had a you know someone from a law firm come in, that they, they, they were very careful not to assign them to somebody that they had represented when they were at the law firm. Um, political contributions, there were some regulations around that. So there was a number of areas that every federal employee at the SEC had to abide by. And then there was also incremental ones for the SEC, particularly trading stocks, mutual funds, things like that. So. So I couldn't do an exam of a mutual fund if I had a dollar in it. So that was the threshold. So, so oftentimes, like a Chicago region, we would hold mutual funds for personal investment outside of the Chicago region, because likely we wouldn't be doing those exams. They would be covered by another region. And so, um, so that, that, that was an area. So I'd consult new employees. I'd give them a training. And then issues would crop up where we would have to work through those challenges um, that may come up. And so I worked directly with, at that time it was Mary Jo Gillette, who was the regional director of the Chicago office. And, and, and f she and I worked through a number of things related to her, her role as, a, as, as the leader of the, uh, that office um, to ensure that we didn't trip, you know, any of our employees tripped you know, any ethics okay. regs. So, uh, anything else we should touch on from that Chicago period? You, you know, the one thing I didn't mention and I, I kind of alluded to, but I didn't get to, is where you, you know Jane and Ahmad Elsabe really helped drive the precursor to the program called Trends. And it was it was you know I mentioned notebooks and disk drives and things. We really tried to automate that program, and part of this started you know post Madoff um, when I was still in Chicago and 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 they did a great job about building out a workflow tool where you could upload documents you would memorialize a particular exam in the system as opposed to on a yellow legal pad and 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 then you know there was the availability that you would have like a, a record that you can refer back to you know, it, that they still refer back to, you know, what did the exam do in, you know, 2003, you know, for this particular firm. And so, and having all that documentation together, have it memorialized, the risk areas were built in that, you know, individual examiners could select risk areas um, and then execute out on that exam based on what those risk areas were. And then there would be, you know, materials, exam resource materials, that they could tap into to help them with that. Okay. You mentioned uh, the Madoff uh, revelations. Um, talk about how that affected you in Chicago, uh, just generally and, and the work. So it's interesting. I had left the SEC in 2008. I went, went and took a, a role in-house at a manufacturer in St. Louis doing ethics investigations. Um, and I, I, I missed the SEC a lot, and I came back a year later. Um, and by that time, it was after a lot of the events had, had, had come to light. And so 
that period of time for me when I was in Chicago from 2009 to 2013, I worked on a number of project teams to help uh, improve exams. We were getting resources for people, for technology. You know, there were some consultants that came in that, that helped um, the agency try to improve and, 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 and fix certain gaps. And so I, there was, a, I think there were 20 project teams. And, and this was a time that Carlo De Florio became the chair, I'm sorry, the director of, of, of OC. Norm Champ was the deputy director. And they led, a lot of it was change management. And uh, so, so they pulled together 20 different project teams that covered different areas, whether it be technology tools, whether it be process, whether it be training people, hiring expertise and subject matter experts from the street to come into the building to help. So there was a number of focus areas that were, 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 were led. And, and so I participated in some of those. And, and, and so it was, it, it was very much a time of change and, and which was hard. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of people just it, it, from being, you know, a leader of the program, there's, you know, change is hard for some people. And, you know, so trying to, to move people to a place where you wanted to be, that you know, we felt was the right place to be um, to, to, to help mitigate some of the challenges and risks we may have had in the past. Was there a sense of, of possibility in here too? I mean, you had people all over the country serving on these these um, focus areas. Right, right. Um, so I would suppose that in some respects it was uh, sort of a good experience to get these people together to talk about. Oh, it was fantastic. Things. It really made it a national program because with the regional offices, there were, at that time there was a lot of autonomy in the regions. And um, I think that with, with Norm and Carlo, um, it really drove a national approach. So I was working on a project team with somebody from Philly and somebody from Atlanta and somebody from LA. And, and so I really got to know other people um, you know, throughout the program, just not just in Chicago. And, so, and I think all the project teams were like that. They were made up of a number of the different regional offices, whether it was a small office, a large office, uh, or a medium-sized office, you know, that's it's generally to get their, their voices on, on these. And, and I, think, I think you're right. I mean, I think a lot of the ideas that came out that led to these project teams came from our program and came from our people saying, we should really do this and we should really do that. And, 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 and the other thing, too, is there were certain things that we weren't legally permitted to do that I think that change, particularly with Dodd Frank and, and 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 other hurdles that we may have had, that we were able to overcome. That historically we would have thought, oh, we can't do that. And so, so for instance, asset verification. So, you know, go, the out the idea of going to uh, a custodian and saying. Okay, we want to confirm that this advisor says they have one billion in assets under management, and these five hundred client accounts. Please provide that information. Like that—that that was not something we could do um, before the Madoff event. And I think what ended up happening is—is is that you know, post that time period, we were able to get the ability to do that. And, and that was something, and in my last year, we confirmed over five trillion in assets under management and really kind of built out that program um, and, and, and the processes. And, 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 and so that's something that, that, that was a big result, I think, to, to, to be able to go to a third party and independently confirm that the assets they say they manage for a client actually exist and they haven't stolen them. Did the commission have to write a rule for that? Is that a Dodd Frank? No, it, 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 they did. It, it, it's not an internal rule. It was something that we were able to get support from externally. You, you mentioned Madoff in the context of the technology improvements, and it sounds like you were you were on that focus group. Um, talk about moving the technology forward and what changed, say, during Carlo's time and into Drew Bowden's time. Right. Technology. So, so I will say one resources. Yeah, that was that was a big push in the project teams that like 
hey, we need some resources to build out these tools. Part of it was that. Part of it was, you know, individuals within the program that really drove those changes. Like I mentioned, you know, the Trends program. That was really driven hard by Jane Jarko and Ahmad Elsabe. They showed some tremendous leadership in pushing that program forward. Um, you know, as we brought in subject matter experts from outside the, so we, we brought in 20 experts covering different expertise, whether it be equity trading, fixed income trading, whether it be municipal securities, whether it be valuation. We had a lot of different experts and we brought in a quant. And I think bringing in that group of experts also drove ideas for new technology and new ways of doing things. Because oftentimes they ended up being from you know, large financial institutions that we regulated and they had these great experiences that they, we could leverage. And so, so that drove, and then Drew, it was very a noticeable change. He, he really transformed how we handled data and how we expanded out our quantitative analytics unit. And, and to the point now where when I left, there was around 20 quants in the program. And I will tell you, and, it, and it's no, no knock on examiners, but towards the end, if I could hire a quant, I would choose a quant over five examiners at any point because the ability of the quant to analyze information across hundreds of firms gave us such a leg up. And, and I think towards the end, we had built out the, the, the national exam analytics tool that was better than anything commercially available. We, for once, the government had a tool that was better than industry. And, and so I think, in the, and, and the credit to Drew Bowden for really starting and having that vision that we were able to carry out with Mark Wyatt, who was, he was an expert that we brought in from the private fund space. Um, and then, you know, towards my time too. And so, and so that, that was an area that, and so the analytics, I mean, it ended up, you know, the other person that, that in, in, in group was the risk team, Jim Reese. He was the chief risk officer um, for the, the, the risk analysis and surveillance team. And he ended up really introducing uh, machine learning and text analytics to the point where we were able to put all the form ADVs, which is an advisor form, into one database and run text analytics for keywords like guaranteed, risk-free, integrity, ethical, you know, that sentiment language that you may say, how are you gonna support that you're risk-free and guaranteed? And, 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 and so they were able, and then it also was a tool to use, it was certain um, you know, topical things at the time. So LIBOR, securities-based swaps, ESG, you know, so that's a tool that carries on that they can surf all the form ADVs. And, and, and so that was another example of technology that was built out. It sounds like this is this um, national exam analytics tool was sort of an iterative thing that it developed yes. over time. Yes, yes. When was it? Like, when did you feel like it was done or ready ready to go out on the road? I, I think it still continues to be, but I mean, where it really, we had hired, um, as part of the, the expansion of the quant team, we hired Elchin Yildirim and Jordan Fisher. Um, and they really, Jordan was a video game programmer. And so very graphic driven and their goal was to make the analytics tool be like a uh, like a, a tax preparation software and so where there was next buttons and it would run automatically run you know errors if there was some sort of issue with how the in information was input so there would be some flags there but then once the information was clean then it would automatically populate potential leads to the point where they were testing dozens of different rules um, through that system. 
And it was, the goal was is to get as many, I mean like, you know, I kind of look at people that I adopt technology. You have 20% that are on the advanced end. And then you have another 50%, 60% that are after adopters. And then, then you have a 20% that can potentially, you know, it, it's a struggle for them to adopt new technology. Um, they were really focused on getting that middle, that large group to be users quickly and to understand it in a way that was user friendly. And they did an amazing job on it. And so I would say 2017, 2018, it really was a mature. And, and then in teaming with Pam Dyson in the Office of Information Technology, we were able to get the support on that to get higher end processing, to get better storage, um, really, because all the analysis, you know, it took some ump from a tech perspective. And so being able to get, you know, the agency to really help us build that out, to be able to manage all that information in a quick, usable way. Did, did were people using this throughout the 2010s, even though it hadn't sort of been developed completely, or was there a yeah, semi I mean, startup? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, it started with Drew. Um, so, uh, you know, I think Drew would have been 2013, 2014, maybe. Um, so okay. I, I really think that, you know, prototypes were being developed. And, yeah, I think by the time I left, there was, it was they were probably on version 7. Um, so they continued to, to, I mean, it was a very valuable program. And so they continued to update it. You know, so for instance, like one of the later versions when I was there, they were able to get a feed of pricing from an outside vendor that fed into the system so they could compare the pricing that was coming from a registrant to what the high-low was for the day to see if there's some sort of outlier there. I mean, and, and, and it also had news feeds. So if there was a significant event, like an earnings release or an acquisition, there would be news feeds that would tie in that could correlate to a spike in price or you know, if, if, if a firm bought it for one price and then it, it sold. But it would also be a trigger for uh, insider trading. So, so if, we, if, if we were able to note that, oh yeah, this firm was, was purchased yesterday, they could you know, run it back three days to see when the, when the firm actually bought um, the securities in the acquired company at the press release and determine whether or not, well, did they know something? You know, so so very very fascinating tool that continued to to grow and grow. So. Okay. Now, some of, some of your contribution to this technology came in Chicago, I guess. Um, you came to DC as as managing executive. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Tell me about that job. That's not one I've heard of a lot. So, the managing executive role was created. I was the second one. So it was created a couple of years, it would have been created around 2011. And what it provided, it was like the chief operating officer for, at that time, it was all the, all the divisions and, you know, we were a large office at, at the time, at OC. And so, you know, we had, you know, close to, at that time it was around 900 people. So, and basically you were responsible for the operations of the organization so the director could focus on the key issues in their mission. So, so for purposes of, of the roles I had, I ran technology, I ran risk, I ran human resources, so I'd be responsible for hiring. Um, I would work with all the regional directors and regional associate directors in terms of rolling out processes and policies and procedures you know, to really focus on that national exam program that we were building um, post Carlo and, 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 and then Drew. And, and, and so that role was a great role for me because what was, I had an advantage because I came from a region. So I had a regional voice in that role. I wasn't necessarily, you know, someone, a bureaucrat, you know, a so-called bureaucrat from D.C. rolling out something. Like I had, a, I had a good working knowledge of how the regions worked, 
which I think helped me be more successful in the role that I had. And it also helped the regions because I had ideas and they'd have, I had their ear, or they had my ear, in terms of trying to, hey, we really have this pain point, we need to fix it. And so whether it be with some of the other divisions from a technology or human resources perspective or you know, whatever it may have been at the time, you know, budgetary constraint. You know, so w another area is just like trying to deal with budget. And so if we had a, you know, a continuing resolution from Congress, or if we had, you know, uh, limited budget dollars that we could use for travel and for other purposes, you know, I'd work through, through that. And, you know, and you think about like the exam program, is about almost a fourth of the agent, maybe a fifth of the agency at that time, it, you know, and, and so it was, you know, over a $250 million budget and just with all the people, and so. So you're moving a lot of things out to the, to the regions, to, uh, to people in OC all over the country. What was, what was the toughest one? Uh, you're making a lot of sales. You're sort of convincing people to do things. What, what, were, what were the challenges that you remember? You know, I think there was some... I think the biggest thing was system driven. Like getting adoption for trends was a tough one because different regions, it, it was often seen because Jane and Ahmad did such a great job about building that out. It was often seen as a Chicago thing. And I think other regions had their own versions they wanted to, to utilize. And so I think getting all of them together to say it doesn't have to be just one, you know, one person driving it. We, we, we did a trends committee. We made it up of small regions, medium regions, large regions. We brought in all the key players. Um, the other thing too is, is, is we built out a technology team in DC and that was led by Ed Schmidt who was our chief technology officer. And Ed had a really difficult job because he had to drive change from a technology perspective that was being driven by the agency, but it was also being driven by our leadership and trying to satisfy a lot of different stakeholders. And it's, it, it, that by far, I think, was the toughest thing for me. Um, and then that carried over to the National Exam Analytics Tool because then it became multiple projects that were from a budget perspective we had a limited budget so those teams would compete in terms of well who's going to get the allocation in terms of money because money wasn't unlimited you know it was, it was, it was, and so having those fights um, you know to try to say okay how are we going to try to move both um, in, a, in a productive way that will help the program and then the second thing I think is 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 slot, uh, like uh, new slots that would come in, new positions that would be become available based on the budget process, okay. how to allocate those to the different regional offices, because every region needed more people. And so making those decisions was always a difficult one because, you know, you were picking between children, you know, so. Let's talk about risk. Yes. OC had been interested in risk for a long time. You look at some of the old documents and they're talking about risk. Um, but it seems like it was becoming more emphasized. Perhaps people were thinking about it differently post Madoff. Right. Um, tell me what your experience was with that. So I think how I looked at risk, and, and you know, I think the three things that I really focused on in my time, particularly as director, was the mission, the people, and managing risk both externally and internally. Um, and so when I th thought about risk, you know, the risk team that Jim Reese led, they had a lot of analytics that they were doing and, and ever expanding. And what drove a lot of it was the growth in the investment advisor space because we didn't have enough people. We just didn't have the resources to adequately cover that space. So we really, instead, you mentioned cyclical exams earlier. It, you know, when we are truly now, we, um, the, the exam program truly is now a risk-based program. And they had to move to that place because they didn't have the luxury and resources 
to continue on an every three to five year cycle. Just didn't have that. And so then it became risk-based. And, and, and so that risk team really built out, you know, some analysis where they looked at probably 50 different factors, whether a firm had custody, whether a firm had a disciplinary history, what was the previous exam's risk rating? Did they have an enforcement action? Did, how many representatives do they have? How large are they? A number of different factors that were considered in coming up with, like who do we believe are the top two to 3,000 highest risk firms? Not that they're high risk, they're just the highest risk. And, and some were high risk, but others were just, just because of they, they, they play in nuanced security types. You know, they do a lot of securities-based swaps or they, you know, had certain investing styles, you know, in the private fund space. Because you had, you know, back in 2013, you know, all the private funds started to register with us. And, you know, that was kind of a, a, a new set of, of you know, specialization we had to build out but a new set of risks that, that, you know, in public funds, you know, the mutual funds, there's regular filings, there was, you know, an auditor, a board of directors. They had a lot of third party service providers that, so there were a lot of independent eyes looking at the mutual fund space. The private fund, it's called private for a reason. And, and so the, the visibility and, 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 and as, as, as Drew Bowden put in his big speech, you know, the sunshine you know, I think was an important factor. But utilizing that risk team, Jim Reese's team, to do that background information. And then he'd provide all that, him and his team, would Brian Snively and others, would provide that information to all the regions on an annual basis. Actually, they updated it every, every six months. And so the regions were getting updated information about new registrants, registrants that withdrew, but then also, you know, just how the risk profiles were changing for those entities. They may not have had custody before, but all of a sudden in 2017, they now had custody, which is a big factor for us to look at. And so, so I think risk was very, very important. And then in 2000, in, 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 I guess it was 2016, we really kind of blew out operational risk as well, because it wasn't necessarily only risk looking outward, but we put in place an operational risk team. And Chuck Karecki had led that for, for a period of time. And he was somebody that came from the Chicago regional office and was a branch chief there. And he moved out to DC. Define operational risk. What do you mean? By sure. That? So, so there's, there, there, there were internal factors that we had to consider of, you know, in terms of, of our management of external risk resourcing, technology, um, you know, cybersecurity became a big data, data, data protection became a, a significant issue back in 2017. But there was a lot, of how we operated as a national program, we needed a risk function to really focus on that. Where should we put, you know, new positions based on regional growth? If, if Miami is growing dramatically, they're going to need more, more, more people down there. So, so doing that analysis, doing the analysis in terms of adoption of, of technology and the risks associated with you know, us not fully adopting where we have people on different methods, um, you know, that, 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 that created some, one, inconsistency. I mean, one of the big things I wanted as director is I wanted an exam in LA to be like an exam in New York that there was that consistency, obviously scoped differently dep depending on the registrant. But in terms of process, we should have, you know, we should have a uniform process. And I, and I, Operesque really helped drive that. Okay. So, so OC had had modules. They had, roughly speaking, the same yeah. modules being used all over the country. But it sounds like the regions sort of imparted their own flavor to the examinations over time. I've heard that. <laughs> you know, I think it just depended. Certain regions had a real specialty in technique. So the Philadelphia office, they had really become the experts in performance advertising. 
that was something that they were well known for. And they built out like a performance calculation tool, like investment performance calculation tool. And so they were known for that. Um, you know, Chicago was known for, you had a lot of, particularly in the broker dealer space, a lot of muni activity, um, you know, a lot of options activity, just given it, it's Chicago and the entities that are there. Um, obviously, New York had the big banking um, affiliates, and so their expertise was a little bit different than, say, L.A. L.A. had more mutual funds in, in the L.A. region, and so they had that specialty. You know, San Francisco had private funds, hedge funds, private equity, Silicon Valley. And so, you know, looking at all the different expertise, you know, uh, there are going to be differences in those programs just based on where they're focused, where they see risk. Miami, you know, a lot of elderly and retirees down in Miami. So the risk of, of fraud by, you know, financial professionals was higher there because it was a vulnerable population. So, you know, there, are way, there is some differences. What I wanted, though, is, is I wanted the core to be consistent because, frankly, the, the core was something that was well thought out, planned, worked through from a risk perspective, and built out through all those project teams that we had done, you know, back in 2010, 11, 12. Um, one more landmark before you, you become acting director. Sure. And that's uh, creating the Office of Risk and Strategy. Right. Um, it sounds like you've been sort of setting the table for that in your discussion of risk. Um, but talk about where the idea came from to, to create this office. Um, and, and sure. Who, what you did, who supported you, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so at that time, risk, so, so as the chief operator, as managing executive, I had technology, I had people, HR, I had risk, and I had some other areas. Um, and then there were also risk teams outside that the quant team was separate, the risk analysis and exam team, the ray team was separate. That was a small team, primarily out of Salt Lake, that had about five, six people, um, all doing great work. But at times I was worried, and, and so was Mark Wyatt, Mark, because Mark and I worked on this together, um, worried that there was some duplication, but then also worried that we may have really good technology in one group that the others could utilize that they weren't getting access to. So that was one driver. The other thing too is, 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 is the role of the managing executive. So much of the time was being spent on technology and HR that I thought, yeah, that we really need a devoted chief risk and strategy officer. And so at that time, the, the decision was is, is that, okay, so let's break out those two teams, um, the risk team, and then we brought the quant team in and we brought the ray team in. So you got all the risk people, all the data analysts together um, and that I think really created some significant synergies, both from technology use, but also just information sharing. And so I really, and it, honestly, it brought some of the best minds that we had into one team. And so I mean, it was really a powerful thing. And, and so, and I think that drove technology use. I think that drove better exams. It, it drove analysis of hundreds of firms through data sets you know, at one time. So when you think about a, a, a program that's understaffed, that was an area that we could really leverage to look at hundreds of firms through a data set instead of doing individual exams. And so from, from a risk mitigation perspective, it, it really was an effective way. And then that got leads that, you know, they'd find anomalies with different firms and they'd send that to the different regional offices as referrals and then the regional offices would be able to, to, to run that information down. But it all came from like a central place. Um, yeah, and communications, did it, did it function pretty well um, the, the, with the regions talking to the um, Office of Risk and Strategy in DC? It did, 
Um, it, it, you know, it, it's funny. It, actually, communication's broader. Let, let, let's touch on sure. that just because I think that's an important point. Um, one of the things that came out of, you know, Carlo and Norm put in was executive committees, operating committees, technology committees, um, really put in some governance. And those committees had representatives from all the regions. So in terms of sharing of ideas, sharing of information, tackling some of the challenges, the program was working together through that governance that was established and in, in a really effective way, which I think broke down a lot of barriers in communication. And included in that, you had people like the head of risk now, the managing executive. So you had DC and the headquarters involved in those discussions as well and trying to solve the problems for the regions. And so, um, so I think from a communications perspective, bringing those committees together really set the stage to where we expanded it out. We had a people committee, um, the technology committee, we had a trends committee. You know, there was a number of different areas that we were able to, to really get buy-in from people. And it really helped, one, make a better product because you got a lot more influence in terms of, of input. And it also made for a, a, you know, a more effective approach and buy-in to go forward in a direction. And so I think from a communications perspective, that was important. From a risk perspective, like each of the regions would focus on risk with their registrants in their region. Some was informal, some was more formal, whether they had dedicated positions. And I think that interplay with the risk teams got a lot stronger once we formed the, that office. Um, the risk and strategy office. I just think, because because one that you had a dedicated team, and you you brought in something some very productive teams into to one place that so so the regions would have you know one place to go to get what they needed and to solve issues. And so for me, I I just thought that that was a a, a pretty effective move that we did. I mean, it was, yeah. and I had you know you know Mark and I brainstormed on this and you know one of the great things about mark was was every time i saw him it was like how can we make oc better today and that was one that i think like that time period to me was that was a place where we made oc better and, uh, and it took it took a lot of work but it got there and, and i think everybody kind of agreed that like this is the right place for them to be so okay uh, so your next step after that was acting director, right? I was acting director. And yeah, surprisingly, that. you know, Drew left, you know, and, and that one surprised me because I, I loved working with Drew. He's the one who really I worked as, as his right-hand person as, as the managing executive for a couple of years. And then Mark came in, who I had worked with Mark, too, um, and he became deputy and, and, uh, and, uh, and then he, he he left, and 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 that one was a surprise, just because of the, the timing. But you know, we it, it was something. There was a, a, a change in election, and you know, there, oftentimes there's some turnover at the director level, and so so uh, acting chair Pivovar re reached out, and I went and chatted with him, and he asked if I'd step into the acting role, and. Of course, I was like, absolutely. And I will tell you that like, I never saw myself as, yeah. You, what, I it? never saw myself as director, <laughs> I, absolutely not. Like, I never aspired to it, right. never saw myself in that role. Well, at first you were acting. And right. a lot of acting directors, they are acting anything, you know, you assume the job is to keep the ship pointed straight and don't screw anything up. Yeah. Uh, was that the approach That was took? not my approach, <laughs> you know. This was my program. I had been in it since 2004, and I was like, you know, I may only get a few months to do this. I am gonna, I am gonna fix the things I want to fix, and I'm gonna make some change, and I'm gonna own it, because this may be my only chance. And 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 that was the approach I took, you know. And I just, I, I felt like I had nothing to lose, and I wanted to to really, you know. If I could, if I could fix some things, I, I was going to do that. So, so what was the first step? 
You know, the first step, like I had some ideas in terms of, you, you know, both growth in, in personnel, um, you know, just with change and rollover of positions, you know, I, you know, I thought it was important to, to have multiple deputies and multiple owners of certain programs, just given their size. And, 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 you know, Jane and I had, had worked through, Jane was, was deputy director at the time. And, and, and I really need more help in DC. And so we had talked about trying to get a little bit more backstop for me in DC. Um, and then also, you know, a lot of the big program areas I think needed support. And so, um, so you saw this movement to, you know, the IAIC program. It had Kristen Snyder and it had Jane. Um, so you saw, in, in, you saw large programs having, you know, um, two heads. And people would say, ah, that never works. But not these people. I mean, like, we all work together pretty darn well. And so you also saw, like, the, the New York program and the Chicago program. I just felt that we needed a little bit more support in the leadership space. Not because that, that anybody had done anything wrong. It was more there was just so much growth or more slots were going to New York and Chicago just given their, their presence. And so we added some associate directors in both of those offices um, and, and gave opportunities for people to get promoted as well, which you know, I think that that was important to me. I grew up in the program. I thought, you know, that they're, they're, I thought it was important to have opportunities for advancement in the program because that trickled all the way down. So um, we also had Dan Call that was our chief counsel. And, and Dan, I worked with quite a bit. Um, he also led the Home Office Investment Advisor Program. So what you saw was, is you saw people having multiple roles. And that I think was really important because you had a lot of regional presence. Like Kristen Snyder was in San Francisco. Kevin Goodman was in Denver. Jane Jarko was in Chicago. Um, and so you saw some of this overlap, you know, and, and then Marshall Gandy got into the mix, you know, where he was co-head with um, Kristen Snyder of, of IA once Jane uh, moved, you know, retired. And so, um, so that, th th those were areas that I, I just felt that it was important. And then we had um, cybersecurity when, and one of the biggest things I faced, the biggest challenge I faced, when, when I started as acting was Jay came in, Jay Clayton, and you know, cybersecurity and data privacy, those were significant areas because of certain market events that had taken place at that time. And we, it, the exam program, um, had just been brought into starting to do exams of Reg SCI entities because that rule became final. And so one of the things that I'm giving a plug to the technology team because I haven't touched that yet, is we built out, Ed Schmidt was primarily in that, and now Dmitry Chesnikov, um, you, know, follow, you know, followed Ed's footsteps, but really to try to, to build out a cybersecurity team. And, and we went out and we hired six or seven ex-CISOs, the chief information securities officers from registrants and from the street to talk about like bringing in some amazing experience. And then um, built out a team of like contractors that could end up being like a call center um, for any sort of cyber event. And, and now you're gonna see that expand with, with, with new proposed rulemaking. But it, exams really built that. And I was really proud of that. I mean, I, th I think that Ed Schmidt really did a phenomenal job, Rich Hannibal. And then we were able to hire Keith Cassidy in to be the leader of that team. And he had been in Ledge Affairs previously um, under Mary Jo White. And I was able to get him to lead this cyber team. And with that, that, that team really gelled and really became a center of excellence for the agency to the point where they were leveraged in many different cyber scenarios that were taking place by other divisions and offices because we had that real expertise built into that team. And so, so that was something I was faced with early. And 
that continued to be a top priority. Even today, it's still a top priority. It, it sounds like you kind of had to build that one from the ground up, too. Though. We did. There oh, yeah. was no sort of yeah. precursor to no. Reg SCI. No, we had a few folks that came over from trading and markets that were part of a, a team called the, the ARP. Um, but then once that rule came into play, we had to hire new people and really grow that program, just, just given the significance and importance of it. And that team was leveraged throughout, you know, under Jay Clayton, and you know, it's being leveraged very strongly today. It's just really turned out to be, that team really did a great job about building out. Historically, when, whenever the examiners would start looking at something new, or even when the exam program was beginning, way back when, inspections, SEC would give people time. They'd give the, the firms time to absorb this, this new way of doing things and get used to it. Um, was that the case with something like Reg SCI? Was there sort of a hand-holding period? Yeah, I, I think there was, with cyber generally, because we also started doing exams of investment advisors, of mutual funds, of broker-dealers in the cybersecurity space. And the approach that we took was very much, um, look, we get that firms are victims. And there's cyber criminals, there's state actors out there trying to hack into our top financial institutions. And we want to make sure that you have the resources and support you need and the information you need. So we ended up putting out a number of risk alerts in the cybersecurity space. Some if there was a, a significant event going on, and some more generally, that like here's our findings from exams we did. It was the first instance that I remember where we actually published the request list announcing that we were gonna do these exams, and here's what we're gonna look for. And I think one of the big themes that you know, I'd like to touch on, just because I think it was important, because it really drove a lot of my decision making, is that we didn't have enough resources to cover what we needed to cover from an exam perspective. So the next best thing was to put out as much guidance as we could, because I felt that if we had that guidance out there, it would help chief compliance officers, it would help firms address risks and address issues more proactively, and we could reach more people by doing that. We could send a risk alert to 15,000 investment advisors or 3,600 broker-dealers, and we could only examine 15% or you know, 10% of them. And so, so that was something that I really felt was important. And, and cyber was one where we really tried to get information out there throughout my time, particularly as director, where we did risk alerts, published the request list. Um, and then we, in, in, in 2020, early 2020, that was January 2020, um, you know, Jay Clayton, Chair Clayton, really wanted um, to put something more comprehensive out. And so he and I worked on, along with the, the, the Technologies Control Program team, the, the Cybersecurity Resilience Report. And that was a comprehensive report to really explain what some of the risks are when it came to cybersecurity and financial institutions and you know our, our, our population that we regulated but then also provide information about what we were seeing and what we were finding and some areas to think about. And, and that was, I mean, that was the only report that we put out in exams in the four years that I was director. I mean, that, that was significant for us. We put in, we put out about 30 risk alerts total in my time, but that, that cyber report was important to put out mm -hmm. just given where the market was at that time. Uh, risk alerts have been around for a while. Yes. Did they change substantially under your leadership? I really tried to get more and more out and build a pipeline and have a plan. So, you know, over the four years we put out, I, I think it was like 32 maybe. So I was doing close to eight a year. And then we had a pipeline of, of a couple dozen. And we really tried to incorporate the regional offices with some of these. So if a regional office did an initiative, an exam initiative, and they had thoughts that they thought would be helpful to get out in a risk alert, we'd let the regional office, not let, the, the regional office would take the initiative to actually draft 
the risk alert, and then we'd be able to funnel that through the process to, you know, they get reviewed by all the commissioners and we get comments from all the commissioners and then they get reviewed by the chair's office. And, and so, you know, that process was always, you know, an interesting challenge at times, depending on what it was. Like, say for instance, ESG, that was a, you know, that was an important one to get out. And, and I think that, that, that but, but yeah, that, so it was a combination of things that were based in DC, but a lot of them came from the regions. They were regional ideas, it was regional work, and it was regional exams that they were summarizing and getting out. So I really tried to push that publication a lot um, because the feedback we received and the thought process is behind, I can reach 15,000 entities with a risk alert when I may only examine 3,000 in a year. And so f to elevate the level of compliance by doing risk alerts, I think really helped. So. Uh, another thing about publications, you've used the phrase branding of the exam program. Yeah. How did you go about doing that? Sure. So, you know, that, that, that idea, I learned a, a tremendous amount from Drew Bowden. And that was an idea that Drew had. Um, that he really felt that we could improve on. And so um, that was something that really landed with me. And so not only did we brand the risk alerts and really beef up production, but we really changed the way our priorities document, which was published every year. So, you know, back in 16 and 15, there were much shorter documents, maybe five pages, and they were just the priorities. And I really felt it was important. Yeah, one second, sir. I think the battery. Okay. Battery is going to run. And I guarantee these are the yellow ones. My sister got me these for. Yep. My sister got me these for Christmas. Those these are backs. the worst. It had two bars. That should last hours. Sorry. Okay. No, you're I, I hope I don't have yellow ones. As we just covered technology and so it's okay. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you bought a box. That's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Never buy rail batteries. I, I stick with the good the yeah. Duracells and Energizers. Machines. Pop that back on. Oh, no, it, it died back. Okay. Sorry about that. No, you're good. In, like... I just want to see where he, where we should. Oh, I'll just I'll just t I'll bring up the priorities doc document. Okay. And we'll go from there. Okay. So we may have to edit that. Yeah, I'll definitely yeah. edit it. I'm okay. Sorry. You were right in mid sentence when you went out. Yeah. Okay. But we'll work it. Yeah, that's great. We'll track back a little bit. Um, we good? We good? Uh, rolling stuff. Okay. So so one of the things about rebranding the exam program is this priorities document. Uh, right. Talk about how that you tra transformed that. Sure. That was important to me because it, 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 it also was part of my theme about getting more information about risk and about priorities out to the registrant population and particularly chief compliance officers. That was really my audience. Um, and so if you look back to before 2017, the priorities documents were typically five, six pages, and it was just the priorities. Here's our priorities for the coming year from an exam perspective. And I just felt that our program had grown in a way where we had a lot of different program areas. The clearing program was new. Um, one thing we haven't talked about is the creation of, of, of physio um, and, and, and the BDX exchange, the BDE and exchange programs. So we had those programs that were relatively new. We also had municipal securities that we were covering. And then we had the technologies controls program in addition to IAIC and, and other programs. So a lot going on that was behind the scenes besides just priorities. And I, I really wanted to put out like an informational document and almost like an annual report. And so we pulled together in 2017 a much larger document that included a lot of information about market risk, things that were going on such as like LIBOR or cybersecurity or different things to, to make it meaningful for the reader besides here's, 
here's what we're going to examine. And so we spent a lot of time putting that together. And I thought that that would be, you know, a very informative document. It also announced our results on, you know, what our coverage was in certain areas, how many exams we did. Um, but more importantly, it was about identifying risk. Because if we're worried about a certain risk, we want to make sure that all the firms are, 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 are in the know on that. Because, you know, to me, what kind of regulator are we if we're identifying risks and we're not telling the public that they should be worried about them? And so, so for, for me, that was a very important tool in change. And so those documents, you know, they ended up being close to 25 pages. Um, and, but I thought that that was important information to share um, as well as the priorities. And we, we expanded those out as well. And we changed, you know, Dan Call had a, a real influence on how we changed um, the, the approach we took as opposed to being pure program area. We took a thematic approach. And, and Kristen Snyder, too, was very instrumental in this because she ran the IAIC program. She ran the San Francisco exam program, so she had regional experience. And then she was now de deputy director as well. And so, and having her influence on this document to talk about retail investors, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's impacts broker dealers, it impacts investment advisors, it impacts mutual funds. So we became more thematical, thematical in that document to really drive home so certain, you know, cybersecurity is being covered by all our program areas. So that became a theme. So, you know, I, I think that that was an important document. To, and, and that was a good way for us to get more information out in our voice. So. Okay. Um, back to risk. Um, the, the event, an emerging risk examination team. Right. Tell me about where that idea came from. What was the need there? Sure. So in my time, What's, what's, what's unique about exams is you cover all the acts primarily. So you have trading and market acts, you know, the exchange act, so you're dealing with broker dealers, municipal securities, um, and uh, exchanges, and clearing agencies. And then you're dealing with investment advisors, and investment companies, and ETFs, and you know, pension consultants, and all the things that are in investment management. Um, and then you have cybersecurity, which kind of overlays all, all over over uh, all, all, all over all of them. Um, and then um, you end up. Uh, one of the things that we had is we had all the different areas, and so it just seemed that when there was a market event, OC was there, but TM was there, enforcement was there. Um, IM was there, Office of Municipal Securities was there potentially, Office of Credit Ratings, you know, a number of different players. But the thing that we had is we had the ability to go in quickly and to help with a market event. And so we had had versions in the past of committees and things, of certain things that would come up that we pull together a committee with all the divisions and offices that were relevant. DIRA is another one. Um, and, but this, this, this idea came from Jay Clayton, Chairman Clayton, you know, in terms of, you know, we should really have like a SWAT team within the exam program that can go out in an, an, an emergency situation and get information, glean information about emerging risks. Not necessarily like cause exams, those were covered by the regional offices. More like, here's an emerging issue, you know, say it's, say it's a bank run or something like that. Say it's, you know, some sort of, you know, significant event, you know, and, and in fact, COVID was a good example with the market declining so quickly. Um, and having a team that was available to go get information for the whole agency, you know, because OC was always monikered as the eyes and ears of the commission because we were out, you know, we, we were one of the few that actually went out, go visited registrants and, you know, travel all over the country. And so, and so I think that that, the thought was, is really have an expert. And then we, we were able to hire Adam Storch to lead that team 
and Adam had previously been the managing executive for um, enforcement. Um, so he had, so he had been the chief operating officer for the enforcement division under Rob Kazami, and so he had some amazing experience, and he agreed to, you know, um, and was selected for that role to lead that team. And so then we went out and we hired, we felt it was important to have some continuities with some real examiners, but then we hired another team. I think we hired eight more experts um, in different areas, whether it be cybersecurity, quants, whether it was valuation, you know, because because oftentimes if there's a market event, particularly in the investment advisor space, you know, the, oftentimes there's a valuation concern as well. And so, so we brought in a number of different experts. And so that was kind of the formation of that team. And then it became utilized right away. I mean, because there's, you know, when, when COVID hit, you know, we were able to use that team right away to help us deal with certain issues that were going on at that time, whether it be through market volatility or other matters that, you know, created some challenges. Okay. Uh, another thing, another kind of joint venture was um, you got together with Trading and Markets on a securities-based swaps right. joint venture. Right. Was that a, a response to a particular event? So that was in response to rulemaking. And so the thought was is we, we put out some rules that had been required by Dodd-Frank. Um, and what we found is in that process, there was just so much overlap between, and it, collaboration, I should say, not overlap, but between trading and markets and exams. Um, the thought was, and this came from Chair Clayton, is like, let's have a joint venture where those teams work together both on the registration process of these new swap dealers that had to register with the SEC, the surveillance, because this rule was unique because it required the SEC to do, you know, explicit surveillance in the, in the rule, which is, is, is historically, it, that was the first time that that had happened. We always did surveillance, but not like this. And so it's a little bit more robust and then have an exam function. And so having those teams work together in this joint venture, you know, it was a new new type of registrant for us that we didn't have a ton of experience with. And so it was important to have that collaboration and honestly have the thought leadership from trading and markets and the operational expertise that the exam program had. So we brought in some experienced folks and, and, and actually started hiring when I was left to, to, to build out that team. Okay. Um, some other new things that are, it seems like a lot of new things are coming through. Um, reg best interest. Right. This is a whole, this is another one of these whole new things, right? Uh, what was the challenge of implementing that? And examining for that. Yeah. So, so it was interesting there, you know, that was, you know, a controversial rulemaking. Um, I think that there was a lot of pushback from certain industry participants. Um, there's some litigation that, that, that was involved in that process. Um, I think for us is it was a new standard on the broker dealer side that was a little like the investment advisor side. And so we had to train staff. We had to prepare training materials for our teams. Um, we had to, to pull together an approach on how to examine. Um, we also wanted to educate the registrant population, you know, about how we were looking at implementation of the rule in coordination with TM, trading markets. Um, so I think those were the big things in staffing. Um, you know, that was something that we needed more, more, more people for in the broker dealer program. And so John Polisi did an excellent job in terms of, he, he led the broker dealer exchange program and he did an excellent job about putting together, you know, different phases of exams, first testing, implementation, training, policies and procedures. And then after a period of time, 
than testing, trading, and actual activity. And so it, it, was, it, was, it was a long period of time to plan for that. And so I think that we did it, and we put out some risk alerts, you know, both before and after. And uh, I think that those were helpful for the industry as well, just for them to get a feel, you know, ultimately with the goal of protecting retail investors. I mean, that was, that was the drive, you know, and so. You had some precedent with the investment advisor the way the investment advisor uh, exams have been done to draw from. Right. Um, ESG is another one. Right. I, I can't imagine there was a lot of precedent for that. No, you know, well, it's funny. Um, there was not, but there was a little. And, and let me explain that. So, so with ESG, how that came about is you had, you know, this would have been back in 2018. So pretty early on, you know, almost, almost five years ago. I started getting calls from firms saying, hey, look, we're a true ESG shop. We have governance, we have rigor, we have discipline. We've been doing this a while. We're real players in providing investment products and investing in ESG. And now everybody's getting into ESG, or so they say. And so that exercise, it's interesting. Though, we started, I, w I went to Chairman Clayton, I said, look, I think we need to look at this more from a fraud angle and a misleading disclosures and advertising angle, which, you know, that's something we always do, whatever it was, you know, in terms of representations by an advisors. But this one just so happened to be pretty mainstream and pretty in the news at the time with ESG. So we went out and did exams of, of firms and, and we used some of the technology that I mentioned earlier in terms of text analytics for form ADDs. Because there wasn't like a central place we could go, well, they all check this box in the ADV that they're an ESG provider. We'd go to websites and we'd go to their form ADV and do some searching and things like that. And that's how we identified who was like advertising and who was out there promoting that they were ESG. And then those exercises became, are your disclosures accurate? Are your policies and procedures in place? And is your advertising not misleading? And so, you know, whether it's emerging markets or whether it's large cap or whether it's municipal securities, whatever it is, this one just happened to be ESG. So it's very, it was a very different subject matter and very robust, I mean, ESG is so wide, you know, um, but the principles were the same. And so if we were citing firms, it was under Section 206, you know, for advertising, 20641. You know, it was pretty, you know, things that we typically had cited for for misleading disclosures and advertising. Okay. And, and even before these new rules, which had been proposed, came into play, you know, so. So yeah, so that, and that, and that was a big initiative. Um, and, 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 you know, I mean, there's been risk alerts since of findings and things like that, and a big priority for the agency. Did you have firms back out of it and say, okay, fine, we're, maybe we're not ESG after all? You know, I, I'm aware of certain firms pulling back yeah. since the proposal came out last spring. Um, but at the time, no, I, I, I think, there was such, so many firms getting into the space because honestly investors wanted it. And particularly institutional investors were really driving, like do you do ESG? Because you know, for pension plans and things like that, we want that, that option. So. Uh, talk about COVID uh, yes. as, a, as a landmark and yes. really unprecedented. Yes, that was an interesting time. And like if you would ask me my most significant challenge leading the program, that was it. Um, for a number of reasons, but like thinking back to that March and April, you know, the toughest decisions were, at least they seemed like it at the time, you know, it was very grave overall, but um, the toughest decisions were our own employees, like making that decision, hey look, everybody just stay in your homes, shelter in place until we figure this thing out. And then pulling out of the field and doing exams remotely. And 
the benefit that, I mean, the agency struggled with that in every division, how they were going to continue to operate. The benefit exams had is our whole role was to operate remotely. We'd go out into the field and conduct an exam. We'd go to Cincinnati, or we'd go to St. Louis, or we'd go to California. We'd do exams out in the field. So we were fortunate that we were used to working remotely, just not from home. We did, we, we, we would do maybe 30% correspondence exams where we actually wouldn't go out to the field before, before COVID hit. So we had some experience there doing paper exams, but it still was a change for us to not be able to go into an actual firm and see what's going on and do an exam there. And so, 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 so that was a challenge. The other challenge too was, and this is the tough, you know, I, I mentioned that like the people were important. Like you know, my approach to be, being the director, I wanted happy people. I wanted people to be excited, as excited as I was to go in every day, whether I was a staff attorney or whether I was a branch chief or whether I was an assistant, I just loved going in every day. I loved my role. I loved the job. I loved the mission. And to me, that was important because not everybody felt that way in, a, in such a large program. So trying to find takeaway pain points for them, you know, was important for me. But with COVID, I mean, that was life and death. We had people pass away. And to me, that, that people I knew well. And, and that to me was very difficult. Um, but I will say that like the team really rallied the support from the, from, from the top leadership of the agency, the commission, particularly Chairman Clayton was, was phenomenal to help us do the right thing to protect our people. So, so that was one piece. Now the, the core piece and, 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 and is how to remain effective in an environment where you were doing correspondence exams for over two years. And I think that the team really found ways through technology and through efficiency to actually get to the same amount of firms in an effective way and still conduct effective exams. And, and, you know, and that showed up in you know, recoveries that we had identified that needed to be repaid to investors, to referrals, to significant findings. Like there were a lot of areas that, you know, we had qualitative measures on what was effectiveness for us. It wasn't just coverage. It was, you know, we needed to measure, like, are we finding things? And, and I think that that team, you know, our team really did a great job about continuing to ensure there was effectiveness. And, and actually working with the industry too, because the industry, a lot of them went remote. And, and so working through some of those challenges with the industry from a policy perspective, um, you know, how they supervise their firms and things like that in this new environment. So, so difficult time, um, certainly probably the most significant thing I had to deal with, um, honestly, in my 20 years at the SEC. Um, and I really credit the team and I credit Chairman Clayton and the commission for being human and, and, and still being responsible. And I thought that that balance was very good. So. Speaking of balances, yes, um, something that, that definitely came up as OC was getting more effective and maybe even you know, becoming better known. Um, was the idea that somehow the line between enforcement and exams was getting blurred. What's your take on that? Yeah, and so, so it's funny. It, it's when examiners were very focused on a number of things. They felt like in terms of what was a good exam. A good exam was finding fraud, which typically ended up in enforcement. A good exam was finding an overbilling to a client or a set of clients and requesting that that money be paid back. Um, those would often be referrals. Fraud, 
like you know finding like real um, theft, misappropriation, those would be good findings. Custody rule violations. You know, there, there's a number really egregious misleading disclosures. Like the examiners, when they find that, if they can't fix it themselves, and it's egregious enough, referring it to enforcement was was the standard, and and that was always seen as a positive result from an exam, and rightfully so. I mean, we're, you know, we're trying to enforce federal securities laws, so you know, we're we're a pl the exam program was a player in that process. Um, I think, you know, when w w with the advent of the asset management unit you saw more enforcement interest in examinations. And so that too, I think, accelerated some of the interest. And some of the discussion about blurred lines that, you know, exams is really, you know, an arm of enforcement. And which, to me, that troubled me because let's go back to the whole reason I wanted to go to the exam program back in 2004. It was because I wanted to fix things. I wanted to fix them quickly, and I wanted to fix them before they needed to go to enforcement, because I thought that that was much better for the investor. Um, and so, how I ran exams was: look, no, we're autonomous. I mean, we have we have our own identity, we have independence, and we're gonna we're gonna do what we think is the right thing to do. And we, we got along great with enforcement, don't, don't as we did all divisions. But we also had our mission, and you know I think enforcement referrals was part of it. But if you see like what we did in recoveries, we started recording and tracking the amount of recoveries that the examiners would find and ask firms to repay clients for overbilling, for system errors, for you know whatever it may be, but where there was harmed investors outside of an enforcement process. And that was important to us. You know, I, th I thought that that, you know, that went to the whole reason that I moved to exams. It's just like instant refunds to harmed investors. And to me, I thought that was really important, um, among other things. And it's funny, like you bring that piece up because I think that drove a lot of my motivation to really push for OC to become a division. And that was really critical for me, is to put OC as a division where we would be independent of, in a more clear way, than the Division of Enforcement, the Division of Trading Markets, the Division of Investment Management. We, I mean, I mean not to mention we were over a thousand people at that time, but particularly I think that was an important message to send that we're an exam program, we have our mission and our function, and it's an important one, and it's independent of the other divisions. We collaborate and work together in things all the time. But I thought that that was a really important message, both for, for, for internally, but also, and, and most importantly, you know, externally, I thought that that was important to say. So did you talk to the chairman and say, hey, how about making us a division? By the I, way, we're close to the end of this tape. Okay. Okay. We're, we're almost finished. Yeah, we've we've got another five minutes max. Yeah. Okay. So so absolutely. So when Jay came in, Let, let's let's make a hard stop. Yeah, make a hard Ready? cut there. Ready? So you can get okay. into this question. Well, hold on one second. Yeah. I gotta switch it. Stop this recording. So you mentioned uh, OC getting division status. Was that one of Chairman Clayton's initiatives? You know, it's interesting when 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 Chairman Clayton started, and back in. 2017, he asked me, you know, how could he help? What would, what would OC want? And, and at the time, you know, I had my list of things, you know, a lot of it was slots, people, technology budget, things like that. But at the end, I kind of in passing said, oh, and we'd like to be a division. And, and, you know, there's certain political sensitivities just given how the exams program was first born, you know, in, in the mid nineties and, 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 you know, certainly, you know, there, there's been some, you know, some opinions that are adverse to the existence of, 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 of OC as its own organization and, and, you know, potentially seen better fitting under other divisions. And so, 
But at that time, we were so large that, you know, it didn't make sense. And, and each year, you know, I'd kind of joke with him about, you know, oh, it'd be great, you know, if we, we could be a division. And so, and, and, you know, I will say that he was very responsive. He's like, well, what does that mean? Like, what would you need to do to change it? And, and there was both, you know, um, a, a, a political piece to that, but there was also, you know, a process piece where, you know, things had to get approved. We had to document certain things and, you know, and, and it in fact took some, I think, some rulemaking to change some of the rules from OC to, in this case, we picked exams as the name. Um, but throughout the, that process, um, you know, occasionally it would come up. And then in 2020, it was the 25 year anniversary of exams because I think it started in 1995. And to me, I thought, you know, I'm in my last year as director, possibly, but, and I thought, you know, I, I'm going to really try. And so, so Jay and I talked about it, and he was, was like, I'm supportive of this. He's like, you guys have done a great job. I think it makes sense for you to be a division. And, you know, the thing that I ask is we want it to be una unanimous among the commissioners. So I went to the different commissioners, and fortunately, I had one that used to be in exams, you know, and that was that was an easy vote to get, um, and you know they were all supportive. The only concern that I had to address was there was concern that if 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 OC became a division, that would OC be creating its own policy outside of the policy divisions like IM and TM. And so we put in place some internal controls um, in our policies and procedures to, which, which was something we did already, but we memorialized it to, to reflect that any issues of, you know, first review, you know, that, that were policy driven, we would consult with trading and markets, investment management. We included OMS as well for many securities. And, 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 and we got a unanimous vote to become a division. I, I, I'd say vote, but it, there wasn't a formal vote, but it was, you know, to me, it was, a, it was probably the highlight of my career at the SEC. Um, just, and actually, the highlight was telling the team, I called a, a Zoom meeting with a thousand people. And I think everybody thought, this was late 2020, I think everybody thought that I was gonna announce that I was leaving. And, but I was able to say that we are now a division. And, and we picked exams. We wanted to keep it simple because, you know, we get questions, well, what's the difference between an inspection and an exam? And I was just like, let's just keep it simple. Division of exams. And, 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 and now it's called the exams. You know, that's, that's, and, and so, but that was a real highlight just to see the Brady Bunch on all the Zooms, you know, like all the, you know, the smiles and the excitement and the little emojis coming up with fireworks and stuff. It was really, to me, that was a really special moment for me as, as director. How has it worked out? Have your successors uh, let you know and said, hey, this, is, this it, has been the best thing going? I think so. I mean, I, I think, you know, there's certain challenges, like they're, they're now facing going back to work, going back into the field. Um, but I think generally, though, the way we left it when I left, we were humming. We were doing exams. We were efficient as we could be. We were doing great publications. You know, I think that that we really were effective in many ways. And 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 I know, you know, Director Best Rich is in place now. You know, he he ran three different regional offices, and so he's very familiar with the, the you know the SEC and the exam program. And so I think it's in good hands. So. Talk about your decision to to leave. It was a tough decision. Um, you know, I, I, I love the SEC. Uh, I, I, I originally went there thinking I'd spend three years and move back to St. Louis, where I'm from. Um, and then I stayed 12 years in Chicago. And then I, the Chicago office. And then I moved to D.C. thinking, well, I'll spend three years in D.C. and then move back home. and. And, you know, I'm still in D.C. And, and, and to me, you know, I really enjoyed the work. Um, I felt that I was in the role 
you know, it was about four and a half years, and, and I thought, you know, it's probably time for somebody with some fresh ideas um, to, to take the helm, and, and, and for a number of reasons. It was a very tough decision, because I love the people, I love the program, I felt like I really excelled there. Um, but I really enjoy my new role, and, 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 and you know, that's been, it's been a great change. Um, so, so, yeah. Well, terrific. This has been a, a great talk. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that we should? You, you know, one thing, just to clip it, um, if we can work it in, like I didn't talk much about physio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clearing. Sure. Let's, can, can let's I talk just about do, that. Let's, let's. Yeah. Uh, so, um, can you explain a little bit about where this would come? Or is there a question yeah. that would have led at, into at, this? At the time that we talk about risk and the setup of the Office of Risk, okay. that would be a good place to, to add it. Okay. Is, is that okay? Yeah, of course. Just just a couple minutes. Yeah. Is there um, a and question we, to profit, or let's just tack on to the answer you already gave? Um, we, we can ask a question. We, yeah. we can okay. talk about it. Um, okay. uh, it's a big subject, actually. Um, one of the and, and we didn't we need to talk about a couple things here, but I'll just I'll throw out a question. In the old days, uh, we, we already talked about how you know the investment advisor area was expanding so greatly. Um, that was always a problem, and Mark Wyatt made the decision to really change things up a, a lot. Tell me about the the two challenges you had. One is moving broker-dealer examiners into the investment advisor area and also getting physio up and running. Right. Yeah, that was a very difficult time in terms of trying to, you know, we talked about operational risk and trying to put our people in the right spots to help us address risks as an organization. And so one space was we had, this, as you mentioned, this tremendous growth in the investment advisor space in terms of population, while the broker-dealer space had, it, it has an SRO in FINRA, and so the coverage that we were getting was, you know, in the mid-40s percentile annually of broker-dealers when we were only getting, you know, 10 to 15 percent in the investment advisor space. So we offered up on a voluntary basis for examiners to sign up to move over to the investment advisor side to help shore up some of the coverage issues we were having. And fortunately, we were able to get a, a between new additions of, of positions that at the time the chair had given us, as well as people moving from the broker dealer program to the investment advisor program, that actually got us a huge jump in what we could do from a coverage perspective, to the point where in 2017 it was around 17%, which was you know, I think it went from 11% to 17% as a result of that. Um, one thing that came out of that is, is we were relying more on FINRA to do their role um, and continue to do exams. So we established a dedicated team, the, the Physio, which was a, a supervisory and oversight team over the FINRA organization. And, and that solved a couple issues because there was some, some strangeness in terms of the interplay that we had with FINRA and the regions where we would go out and do exams together. And then we turn around and oversee those exams in an oversight function. And we thought that we would put in place a, 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 you know, a dedicated team to only do oversight. And that, I think, helped relations, but it also actually helped helped us improve quality and work with FINRA in ways for improvement overall. And Kevin Goodman ran that team. He was seasoned associate director for us. He led in the, um, he led the Denver program. He also had filled in a number of times as regional director on an acting basis, both in Fort Worth and as well as Denver. And so he's a great leader for that and really stepped in and, and was able to um, build out that team because um, that team was a new team that needed to be built out. And so, and similarly, you know, we, we, we better defined the clearing program um, because we had a clearing program. It, it, it arose out of Dodd-Frank and it was responsible for regulating, you know, the you know, less than 20, but very critical backbone for the financial markets, um, the clearing agencies. And, 
and, and we put about that time we put Dan Gregus in charge of that team and got them some more resources to help them because of the significance of that um, program and its mandate, um, particularly with, you know, it, it really was, you know, all the transactions clearing through a few different entities. I mean, just there's a high point of risk. And, and Dan, you know, he, he had ran the broker dealer program in Chicago um, and he had a great background to jump into that role and lead that team. And half of that team was in Chicago and half in New York. So from a geography perspective, it made sense for Dan to step in there. And he still, you know, again, with multiple roles, he still ran the Chicago Broker Dealer Program, but then he led our national um, clearing program too. Well, this has been a great talk. Um, you've shed an awful lot of light on, on some things that I've been working toward for a long time. So thank you very much. Ken, thank you. And, and it's so fun to talk about and so many memories come back. And so um, really appreciate you taking the time to, to record this for us because honestly, I think it's important for people to know the history of this agency in a documented way. And I think we can learn a lot from what I've learned in the past and what other people have learned in the past. So thank you. Terrific. That's a wrap. Okay. All right. Very nice. Yeah, Very nice. Good. Thank, nice you. Job. Thank, yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Patience with the technical stuff. Oh no, no you're, you're, you're great. <sighs>